Okay, so today we will be covering everything you need to know for the calendar year end processing using the redesign software, including both the USAS side as well as the USP side. I'll be covering the USAS side and Lori will later cover the USP side. Please mute yourself, but also feel free to ask questions by unmuting yourself and, spe or, and speaking up or sending a chat message or sending a message in chat. But if you do send a message through chat, make sure you send it to everyone. That way if I, if it's just to me and I miss it, Michelle or Amanda will see it as well. And remember, don't be shy. If you have a question or you're wondering about something, someone else is wondering the same thing and we're all in it together. So I am gonna go to the training page to, as soon as I find my mouse. Okay, to start with uh, to show you where the PowerPoint is. So this is the wiki page. If I go down to meetings and trainings, this is where you guys registered for today's meeting. But under the redesign section, here's the calendar year end 2020. Uh, PowerPoints, checklists, supporting documentation, and then Lori will cover this side for the USP side, USPS side. You can find today's agenda here. And after this meeting, we'll record, we'll have the recording here, as well as where you registered. We'll put the link here under the recording link column. Okay, so. We're gonna to review today for the 2020 USAS calendar year end, steps that you can do now for the 1099 preparation. We will review the month end closing procedures for districts as well as the calendar year closing procedures. We will look at what changed with the 1099 forms for 2020 as well as what the forms look like. And we will review preparing for the 1099 submission. So one thing that you can do before calendar year end is to get acquainted with the, the new forms as well as the usage of these new forms. We will take a look at these forms later, but just to give you a heads up, there is a new form 1099 NEC and it stands for non-employee compensation, which if you recall, non-employee compensation used to get reported on the 1099 miscellaneous form. Therefore, for 2020, the 1099 miscellaneous form also changed. It provided a link here on the PowerPoint for the instructions as for the forms. <clears throat> Another thing you can do now before year end is to review and verify your vendors, such as the vendor tax ID type. You'll want to determine whether or not they should be using their social security number or their employer identification number. You'll want to review the vendor ID number to verify it's correct. And that would be the actual number or either their social security number or the EIN number. You want to make sure the right vendors type 1099 is identified. And these types are non-employee compensation, non-1099, attorney gross proceeds, royalties, rents, other income, and medical and healthcare. And you'll want to verify the vendors 1099 locations, which is their address. You'll find all this information on the vendor's record under core. So if you need to update or change any of these details, you'll do so in these sections. So on the vendor record, you have the 1099 section. 
that this is a drop down that you can either pick social security number or EIN number. The ID number is the actual social security number or EIN number. And here's your type. So you want to verify that information, but that is where you would change it or update it if needed. Further down on the vendor's record under the core menu is locations. And that is where the vendor name and address will be pulled from for the 1099 forms. And it's based on the check mark that the user chooses. So here's the check mark that I was referring to. And keep in mind that the vendor's name and address can be different than the PO location and check location. Um, and the 1099 name and address should come from the W9 collected from the vendor. So here you have the primary address that's different for the purchase order and checks and a different name address. And this one will be used for the 1099 forms. Also remember, if you worked in classic software that you were, you could utilize the second name field and use 1099 colon as a prefix before the name so that that would pull the 1099 name for processing. So we advise all districts, especially for the first time processing 1099s in the redesigned software, they will want to review all 1099 addresses for accuracy make sure that didn't somehow get down in the wrong field in the redesign. So how do you verify all this information? There are several, several options to do this in the redesign. You can use the vendor's grid under core. You can use the template report called the SSDT 1099 vendor report. And you can also use the 1099 extracts report found under the periodic menu. We will review all of these, but they can be used interchangeably, but some may be more helpful at different points in the process. For example, the vendor's grid is convenient, convenient to use when updating the information. In the template report called the SSDT 1099 vendor report, that you can find under, under the report manager is useful to run throughout the year as a double check of your vendors. And the 1099 extract report can be used to verify the information prior to creating the actual 1099 tape file. So there's various uses for, for options to review this data. So using the vendor's grid, you can review and verify all your data displayed on the grid, or you can create a report from your grid results. And you would do this by utilizing that more button and pulling in the fields that you want to review. So on the grid, you'll want to pull in like the type 1099, tax ID type, ID number, uh, year to date, taxable total, and you can even pull in the location to review. So by reviewing the grid, you can review all the information to make sure the tax types are correct, um, whether they're using the SSN number or the EIN number as well as you'll want to identify all your vendors, your 1099 vendors are correct. So here on the grid, you can see all the information for Charlie Brown and the Peanuts gang. I used the filter here under the primary name, but if that was blank, all your vendors would show that pulls in those fields. And you can generate a report from these 
grid details. One point I do want to make is as you're verifying this information and you're unsure if it's a social security or an EIN number should be used, the district will want to look at the W-9 form collected from the vendor. There is also an optional program with the IRS. It's, I think, the, called the TIN Match Program. It's an IRS interactive program, and this is completely optional, but this program allows you to enter up to 25 names and tax ID number combinations and get immediate results. So an example of a report from the vendor's grid is shown here on the screen. You can see that it has all the columns that I pulled in with the more button with the grand total. You'll want to verify the 1099 data to ensure you capture all the 1099 vendors who should actually receive a form by identifying all the 1099 vendors as well as identifying all your non-1099 vendors and reviewing both. You'll want to review both 1099 types, year-to-date tax tables, and this way by reviewing and verifying you'll be able to identify who should actually receive the form. So once you have the more button on the grid, you can also use filters on the grid to give you more results. So for example, on this grid, I captured all my active vendors by entering T for true to check vendors that have $600, which is the threshold, $600 or more, I would enter the, I don't know what you call it, the carrot and the equals 600 or the greater, greater than or equal 600 in the tax year to date taxable total. And under the tax or under the type 1099, I entered the greater than and less than sign non 1099. And this excludes any 1099 type vendors. Once I get all my results, again, you can create a report like I showed you earlier of this, or you can save these grid results. You can also change this type to pull in just your attorneys or your rents. So this column, oops, sorry. You can put the R under the type and pull up your rents and royalties and filter that way. You can also put A for attorney gross proceeds and filter your grid that way. And again, you can generate the reports from the grid results, which is nice. You can also use the grid with advanced query as an alternate to typing filters in the grid. So instead of using the filters on top of your columns of the grid, you will click the advanced query button on your grid and you can achieve the same results because you would pull these fields, you would find your active field over here, drag it over here, set it to equal true, find your type 1099, drag it over here, not equals, non 1099 and so forth. So you're gonna get the same results once you apply your query. Once you apply your query, all your results will come below this screenshot or this, the grid, the advanced query grid. The advantage of using um, advanced queries is that you can save your query. To use it again, you can call it the 1099 vendors. And then next year, you can use this drop down, find your query, and have it all set up for you. So that's very handy. And again, I mentioned that you'll want to check your non 1099 vendors that may have $600 or more in year to date activity. 
and you're just reviewing them just to make sure they're accurately marked as a non-1099 vendor. You also check this in the classic software. But to do this, you would set your filter to true to pull your active vendors. The type equals non-1099 and year to date greater or equal to $600. That way the district ensures that there are any non-1099 vendors marked in the system that should be receiving the form. And you can change the filter. This is the slide I just showed. You can change any of these filters. You can put, pull in your type equals attorney. This is your advanced query. So again, what you can do with advanced query is the same as filtering the grids on the top. So you could do equals rents and produce a report of all your rent 1099 vendors and so forth. The other option I mentioned to verify data was using the template report under the report manager called the SSDT 1099 vendor report. You'll run this SSDT vendor report to check all the 1099 data in order to ensure the names, addresses, ID, and amounts are correct. This report will be helpful for districts to use throughout the year, even before December, just to keep an eye out on 1099 vendor information, for instance. This report will show year-to-date taxable total and year-to-date total they're usually the same, but they may be different if a vendor was paid an amount that doesn't belong on a 1099. And if that's the case, a vendor adjustment may be necessary, and I'll show you that in a moment. By default, it does show you all types of 1099 vendors. So you have your attorney vendors, your medical and healthcare vendors, and your non-employee on this particular report. However, with the flexibility of the redesign, you can modify the configure filters on your report to include all 1099 types regardless of um, the IRS $600 requirement, or you can change, you can change any of these uh, properties, operations, you can put attorneys here and produce a report. So it's very flexible. You can also, once you set these configure filters, you can save your report here. I don't have the whole field, but you save as you enter the name that you wanna save it as. And that way you have that report saved and you don't have to set it up again. So the other, the, the third option that you can, the districts can use to verify information would be the 1099 extracts report, which is found under the periodic menu. And it also has the option to create the tape file that is used for the IRS submission. So the, this menu option is gonna look different whether the ITC or the, whether the district submits the 1099 tape file. And I will show you these difference. I'll show you these differences, but I'm gonna go over it in general now and then we'll hop into the, into a instance. So this report can be used to verify data. It does ex default to exclude vendors with no tax ID. You do have to pick the type of return before these options become available. So once you click one, or you can click one, you can click both, and then these options will appear to either print or generate the uh, extract file. 
Uh, one note is uh, this 2020, and I'll show you this in the database too, this won't even become an option if the user does not have the December posting period created. It doesn't have to be an open period. It doesn't have to be a current period. It just has to exist on the posting period grid. So if your user is saying, I can't see the option for 2020, that's where you would redirect re them is to go under core posting periods to check to see if they have the December posting period created. So I mentioned sometimes you need to make a vendor adjustment. Um, some examples may be like a prior year voided check that's in the total that shouldn't be a royalty payment, maybe combining vendor records, or I know in some cases under the IRS guidelines, the deceased employee's wages may be required to be reported on a 1099. So this is where you would make the adjustments and you would find this under the vendor record under core. And to do it, you would simply view the vendor by clicking the eyeball, clicking vendor adjustments, creating, clicking the create button to create the vendor adjustment. And then you can enter the information, the date, the adjustment for the deceased employer or prior year void. This will default to taxable and this amount can either be positive or negative. So I don't see any questions, but if you guys have any, please speak up. Get my mouse to work, there we go. So month end closing. At the end of December, the districts will wanna proceed with closing out the month of December like they normally would. They'll enter all their transactions for the current month, purchase orders, receipts, entries, anything they need to enter. They'll attempt to reconcile the USAS records with their bank or banks by performing the bank reconciliation procedure. And that link is provided in the calendar year checklist that I showed you under the, where you can find supporting documentation. And under the periodic menu, the user will want to select cash reconciliation to enter your cash reconciliation information for that month. The user will then want to generate an SSDT cash summary report, as well as the SSDT financial report and compare the totals for them. Now the cash summary report, remember, pulls in all current data. So when the December posting period is current, the cash summary re report will pull in December totals. And then you'll want to verify that total with the column on the financial detail that is marked month to date totals. And the totals should match. And when they do, they can smile because they're in balance and they may proceed. Districts often want to run additional reports. Some of them are their own personal ones that they normally run. But another one that is often ran and is totally optional is the spending plan summary report. So that could be a reminder to the districts if they want to run that or any other desired reports that they normally would run. So currently there are now 27 month end reports included in the monthly reports archive bundle. These can be found under the utility menu option and then proceeding to the file archive. I know this user listing AOS extract is one of the new ones and we continue to update the information in the wiki as well. So those are suggested or those are the 
reports that are automatically created when the posting period is closed. So again, the bundle will run when the posting period is closed. One piece of advice is the user should wait until that bundle is complete by close, before closing in another month. Um, if for some reason the user goes back and opens up a posting period and then does not want the report bundle to run for that posting period again, they could navigate to the report menu and go under report bundle and disable their bundle by clicking this checkbox. And you can see the, if you hover, there's a tool tip that says, is this, is this report bundle enabled? So by unclicking it, it disables it. Um, if they need to delete a bundle, they can do so but it's the entire bundle, it's not individual reports. And you would click on the, the X to delete if the user chooses. So calendar year closing. The user may want to generate additional calendar year reports, like a workers' comp report. The proration utility program can be very helpful generating a spreadsheet, which is used to assist in calculating and prorating that premium amount that the Bureau of Workers' Comp charged you. So by using this proration utility, it'll take that premium, say $100,000, and prorate it to all the accounts that you set up in your proration utility spreadsheet. And I'll show you that in a minute. So this is what it looks like. When you go to under utilities to the proration utility, you'll want to choose your time period calendar year to date. And this filter should be set up already and it's the same setup as any filter you would, but for this filter, I would set, suggest setting up all expenditures with the 100s in the filter. So it would be one parentheses parentheses to capture all your wages and salary accounts. You'll want to name your file name the screenshot shows workers comp 2019. I would suggest doing workers comp 2020. Once you name that and you click on create, the, you'll enter this, uh, the amount of your premium here. And then when you hit download, it'll download into an Excel spreadsheet and prorate that $100,000 into the various accounts of your certified or classified salary accounts. So that's kind of sweet. So so now I'm going to go through some slides and then I'll go to the demo to show you as well. But once all your 1099 data is verified and balanced, the district runs the 1099 extracts option under the periodic menu. The user will choose the output file type, which is either the IRS format, and this would be used for creating your tape file and for the IRS submission, or you can choose the XML format, which would be used for printing 1099s with a third-party software, at least for 2020. Um, the other options on this menu will be different depending on if an ITC or, or if a district submits the file to the IRS. And I'll show you those in a moment. 
So this slide shows you a general calendar year and process. So the printing of the 1099 for forms will be used, will be using the XML file. The district should send you a secure email containing this XML file so that the ITC can print them. The ITC will upload this file into the Edge software or any other software that you may be using to print the 1099 forms on self-sealing laser forms. And then these are run through a self-sealer to seal the 1099 forms. For the submission. Do you see the chat? There's a couple questions in the chat. Oh, thank you. I see the little red new message. Okay, so one of the questions is, what is the easiest way for the user to verify that the bundle is complete? No, I would not count the reports in the file archive, but there is a different, another way. And if I recall, it is, under system monitor. And going under here, am I correct, Michelle and Amanda? This is where you would check to make sure that they're, oh, right here, report bundle, just to make sure it is um, complete. There's another question about, do you mean using one parentheses parentheses? And if you all can see that in the chat, the answer is yes. If I said that incorrectly, I apologize. And that is for the workers comp filter. That way you can pull all your objects of 100s into your spreadsheet. You guys can still see my screen, correct? Yes. Okay. Pat, there's another question about, uh, could, could they use the job scheduler as far as seeing if those the bundle completed? I believe that that would be accurate, they could. Yes, that is correct. Sometimes I have to see it. Yeah, so I got you. I'm sorry, I was I was typing up a message to have your back too here, Pat. Um, I think the in use us the trick is that the job scheduler can only be seen by users with admin access. So it depends on the user that's trying to keep track of this. If it's somebody you know at the district. They might not be able to see all of the jobs because um, this one is going to be run by the system instead of by the user, I believe. So I think they would need a special permission, um, which we can double check on that. But I think the easiest way is kind of what Carrie said to start, um, except for with the modification, is keeping an eye on them in the file archive is an option. They don't necessarily have to like count all of the reports though, because they will always run in the same order. So um, I don't know off the top of my head what the last report is, but once you um, know what the last report is gonna be, then they could just look to make sure the last one's complete. I don't know I'm, if that's the last one or not, but. And I'm sorry, I stepped away for a minute, Pat. I'm so sorry, but. Um, one thing, and I'm not sure if you already mentioned this, but um, in regards to the report bundles, and I'm sure, I think Pat's gonna cover this later, but um, we do have a new tab that's gonna go out there before the end of the year. Um, there's gonna be a calendar 
year end report. Yep, right up there where Pat's pointing to, there's going to be a calendar year end report uh, tab. Um, and what we're going to do is from here on out, the calendar year end bundle is going to show in that tab as well as the 1099 um, files. So those will all be placed in that new tab and underneath the file archive. You guys have any other questions? Okay, thank you for letting me know. So this year with the redesigned software, the submission to the for the 1099 tape file can actually be done by the district or the ITC. If it's if the ITC is submitting on behalf of the districts, the district will need to send the ITC a secure email with the tape file. The ITC will file transfer the, that file in the IRS format created in redesign software, and they'll bring it over to the VMS side classic software. Now, last week was the classic software calendar year end with the processes. So I'm not gonna go in uh, detail with that, but I, I wanted to mention that. Now, if the district is submitting it, then that tape file would have another procedure. And we'll go over that. The next step for the district would be to create a new posting period for January under core posting periods. And then eventually they'll close December by clicking on that icon to close the period. And again, the monthly reports archive bundle will automatically generate when the posting period is closed. And that is it. The district is now closed for the month in the calendar year. So each district should receive vendor copies of the 1099 NEC forms. They should also receive vendor copies of the 1099 miscellaneous forms. They should get the district copies of both the NEC and miscellaneous 1099 forms, as well as the instructions on how to distribute the 1099s. And it wouldn't hurt to give them the due dates too. So why all the changes on the 1099s? And actually the 1099 NEC form is not new. It was last used up until 1982, which was the year that Michael Jackson released Thriller. The Dow Jones Industrial Average closed at 1,046. And the Commodore home computer was launched. So that's just some fun tidbits of information to enjoy because we have come a long way. But, and that form is coming back. So now in 2020, that same form is back. And it's because in 2015, the PATH Act, and that stands for Protecting Americans from Tax Hikes, that act, changed the due dates. So you had non-employee compensation miscellaneous forms that were due at a different time than the other 1099 vendors. And it was confusing and often caused late returns. So they brought it back and now non-employee compensation that was previously reported on the miscellaneous form is now on the NEC form. And again, I've attached the link to the PowerPoint. This is what the new NEC non-employee compensation form looks like. Box one is, would include the amount of non-employee compensation. Box four will include any amounts held to comply with any backup withholding requirements that the districts may have. And box five through seven will be including any state withholding information.
You will use this uh, form 1099-NEC for payments of $600 or more for services of non-employees and, and attorneys. The amounts will re be reported in box one on the new form. The other new thing is there is no automatic extension available for this form. You can request, an, or the districts can request an extension, but it must be submitted on a paper form 8809, and the user will want to also refer to part A, section eight regarding extensions. Also, if there are any prior year non-employee compensation corrections to make, since it's a prior year and in prior years, the 1099 miscellaneous form was used, that is the form that you must use if it's a correction for 2019, for instance. So since the non-employee compensation moved off this form, this form 1099 miscellaneous was also revised. And the one probably used more commonly would be the gross proceeds from to an attorney, which would be in box 10. However, if a deceased employee's wages are required by the IRS guidelines to be reported on the 1099, this will be, now be reported on under other income, other income box three. So this slide shows you information in regards to filing of the forms, the instructions, and the due dates. The 1099 NEC form must be mailed to the vendor as well as must be filed by the IRS by February 1st, 2021. Normally this would be January 31st, but this date in 2021 falls on a Sunday, so you have until February 1st this year. These dates hold true whether the submission is on paper or electronically, but everybody is doing it electronically. The 1099 miscellaneous form, if submitted by paper, the IRS submission date is due March 1st. But as we are all IRS electronically filing, it is due by March 31st. And the instructions for both forms can be found in the PDF format at that link. So to submit to the IRS electronically, either the ITC or the user will be utilizing the IRS FIRE system. And new this year, as I mentioned, with the redesigned software, the ITC can submit data on behalf of the districts, which is what we've been doing for a few years. But now the new feature is the district has the ability to submit their own data to the IRS using the redesigned software. And just a reminder, when submitting the 1099 data electronically, the IRS 1096 transmittal, transmittal form is not required. We do recommend ITCs setting a deadline with your districts so that you can take vacation, but also have time to print the 1099 forms you'll have time to return these forms to the districts in order for them to have time to distribute and mail these forms by the deadline in time that you will need to combine the classic files with the redesigned files if the ITC is submitting them on behalf of the district. So that all takes time. So set a deadline and that will ensure everything runs smooth. In order for the district to be able to submit themselves um, to the IRS, the district must have filed application 4419 with the IRS in order to receive a five digit transmitter control code that's required. And also in, two, uh, in October, 2019, this process for first time transmitters 
has to electronically file this form 4419 when requesting this code. Also required for first time transmitters is a test file um, submission prior to the very first real submission. And again, last on November 6, 2020, Michelle did cover the 1099 reporting requirements as well as the IRS test submission steps during the classic calendar year webinar. So please reference those slides on the classic PowerPoint. And remember the recording is also on the the recording of the webinar can also be found on the ITC training and registration page. So this was this slide was presented also in the classic calendar year meeting, but I thought it was a good slide to share again. It shows the IRS fire system dates that are when their system is down for processing, as well as dates availability for submission. So 1099 files submitted, sorry. The 1099 files submitted to the IRS by the district once the district has this transmitter control code from the IRS, that's that five digit code, they will enter this transmitter control code in the redesign software under system configuration and then IRS form 1099 submission configuration. So I am gonna jump into a demo. And I'm going to show you the differences in the menu options based on whether the district submits or if the ITC submits on behalf of their districts. First, I want to show you that 1099 extracts program that I talked about under the periodic menu. You notice there's no option for 2020. And I'm sure a user will ask you a question, why isn't 2020 showing? And if you recall, I said December posting period must exist on this posting period. And again, it doesn't have to be open. It doesn't have to be current. It just has to be created. So once you create it, I'm gonna go into another instance, you will have that option to pick Two thousand twenty. So I have my screen a little big. There we go. Okay, so let's set up a district. A district that is going to submit their own IRS tape file. So again, you have to have the transmitter control code receive from the IRS, and then you would go to system configuration, find the IRS form 1099 system configuration, click on that. You'll check mark the box district will submit 1099 file to the IRS, and you'll enter the five digit code and click save. I wanted to show you something. As you hover over this, it will give you a tool tip that reminds the user of this code that's assigned by the IRS in the application form 4419. Also, if they happen to just click that check mark and forget to fill out that transmitter code. 
when they go to run that 1099 extracts, it's gonna error out and tell you a valid transmitter code has not been defined. So that's both the check mark and the code has to be entered. Once that gets entered, your menu options, which I'll should compare in a moment, are going to change. You're going to have more options on the menu when the district is going to submit their own file. So this is the year, payment year drop down, and now it shows 2020 because the December posting period is created. You can click on one type of return or both. So you have the ability to produce one or both. The output file type is a drop down. The IRS format is creates the tape file for submission. The XML format is the printing of the 1099s. You have the district names. This will default being checked um, to exclude vendors, but it, you are able to uncheck it if the district chooses their TIN number and their address. Now, some of the fields that are on the district menu when they're submitting that are not on the ITC menu is the contact name because they're now submitting um, the email, the prior year submission question, this question approved for combined federal and state filing program. And the submission type. So I'll show you that in a minute of what the ITC's menu options look like. So when I generate the 1099 report, which if you recall, I said can be used to verify data. So this can be run as many times. You're gonna get, now remember I checked both boxes to get 1099 miscellaneous and 1099 NEC. So I got both files here. This is the non-employment compensation extract report. And you can verify your total, the number, the address, the vendor. And that looks similar too for the 1099 miscellaneous report. One of the things that I've came across with is when I've checked both boxes here, and I know I have both returns, but I only get one, make sure you check your pop-up blockers. When the pop-up blocker blocked me, only one report was produced. So keep that in mind. You also on this menu have the option to generate the extract file. So again, I have my information set up. Oh, I'm sorry. The submission type here, you, if they're first time filers, it'd be the test. If it's a correction, you would choose that. And this, we're gonna do the original. And uh, the amount types, if they ever change, would be filled in there. When you generate the extract file, it will produce the tape file that would be used to submit using the IRS FIRE home system. That can be found at fire.irs.gov. It also produces the 1099 text file, which is the um, transmitter report similar to the TR-1099. It has the district information and EIN number and the totals. Now this number of pays does not necessarily mean it's for rent payments. It's a total. 
So that can be confusing and that may change. So if, so that's what um, a district submitting their own file looks like. So let's remove the configuration for the district to submit and I'll show you what it looks like for the ITC. So there is no, this step does not, is not included when the ITC is submitting the file on behalf of the district. So you do not, you can skip that step. And then when you go to the periodic menu, you see a lot less options like the name, email, submission type, but everything's similar. Do both forms. You can choose your file type, the name of the school. When I generate the 1099 report, it creates both the NEC and the MIS report. And one thing I do want to mention though, when the ITC is submitting on behalf of the districts, this output file name, it might be helpful to rename the file name to distinguish between different um, files. That's totally up to the ITC, but that might be a tip. So that's what it looks like in the system. The, when, you, when the district is submitting on behalf of the districts and you generate the extract file, you will not get this report. This report is only for the district submitting their own file. And the reason is the ITC that is submitting on behalf of the districts is gonna take that information and um, move it over to the classic software side. I'm going to go back. And to the PowerPoint. I've talked about these, but they are there are good screenshots in the PowerPoint. Now when the IT submits the file for the districts, you're going to have to take that redesigned file and go to the classic software refer to that recording that Michelle did last week in the PowerPoint to, for the instructions and procedures. Um, what the ITC will do is create one file by appending all the district's classic tape files as well as the redesigned tape files into a single file in order to submit to the IRS. And just a note, when you're creating your append command, the classic tape files must be entered before the redesigned tape files. These are the same slides as last week. You'll run the 1099 or TR1099 program under the classic software. Um, here's the steps that you'll need to enter the information. The program will produce a TR1099 report similar to that report that I showed you that when the redesigned districts submit, now the ITC will get this report through the classic software. And we recommend keeping that on file at your site. It'll also create the DAT file, and this file is, is generated to be submitted using the IRS FIRE system by the ITC. So to complete the transmittal, the ITC would need to submit that DAT file generated, and they can use the instructions found in that publication 1220, which again, on our, um, earlier when I showed you the supporting documentation for that IRS 20 or 1220 um, publication is available right on our website. So they can, you can refer to that. 
this is the system that connects you to the fire system where you'll upload your file from the ITC PC to their website and make sure you keep a copy of that transmittal fire file and report for your record. So Michelle touched on this earlier. We have an upcoming calendar year enhancement. It will be release 8.11.0 and it's scheduled to be completed prior to the end of the calendar year. If you wanna follow it, it's a JIRA issue, USAS R4442. And again, what this is gonna do, I showed you under the report bundles, I'm sorry, utilities file archive. We are now gonna have a calendar year reports tab. So it, under that tab, we'll have the generated XML print files, the tape submission files, the transmitter report, and the PDF 1099 report. They'll all be sent to that calendar year end tab. Um, and we'll also update where the December calendar year end, or we'll, we'll also update the SSDT calendar year end report bundle to send the reports to the calendar year archive. But the previous years, files are, are going to still be stayed under the monthly December monthly archive. Sorry if I stumbled over that a little bit. So are there any questions? I think I missed a couple chats. Thank you, Amanda and Michelle. And if there are no questions, um, I wanted to remind you guys of the upcoming Fridays with Fiscal. We have a review of the major highlights for both USPS and USAS from September to the current date. That will be held on December 4th at nine o'clock. We also have another um, Fridays with Fiscal regarding customizing a template form file. That will be held on December 11th at 9 a.m. We hope that you guys all can make it and here's the link to register. That is all I have. Um, if there are no questions, I will some um this is this is michelle um i know we've had some questions regarding more or more irs questions um regarding combined federal state uh submission and the attorneys whether they're on the miscellaneous form or the nec form um uh, we'll see we'll try to find some links here to get that information to you guys and if we don't get them to you by the end of today's session we will send an email out uh, with that information. I know somebody also asked about deceased employees. So um, we'll make sure that um, we'll try to point you guys in the right direction as to uh, where that information is on the IRS website. Thank you. Okay, so let's all take a five minute break, stretch, get a cup of coffee, and then Lori will cover the USPS side for calendar year and processing in 2020. Thank you, everybody. Have a great Friday the 13th. <laughs> you want to stop the recording, Pat? I'm going to go ahead and resume the recording. Okay. Um, as we had talked about before, uh, as Pat had talked about, um, in order to get to the PowerPoints and everything that we have listed for um, all of the information for calendar year end, you could go out to our wiki page. And when you're out on the wiki page, if you went to the meetings and trainings, 
um, and the ITC uh, redesign 20 uh, calendar year end meeting. Um, you'll see the USPS calendar year end data is here. We have the, the presentation, which we're going to go over right now, um, the supporting documentation, which there are quite a few supporting documents, as well as the closing procedures. And you can see that we have that out there in PDF as well as Word format. Um, just for the, the fact that if you as the ITCs want to take that word format and kind of uh, move things around and make it your own that you can kind of supply to your districts how you want them to process their year end, uh, the checklist for the year end, you can definitely do that. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about today is the changes for 20 uh, for 2021. Um, I kind of wanted to go over that first because it's uh, things that we're going to be referring to in our, our review uh, for the calendar year end. So we're gonna go ahead and just kind of talk about the changes first. So um, get ready because we have several changes this year. So buckle up and get ready for the ride. Um, we'll go through this. And if there are questions, please, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask the questions or um, you can send a chat message as well. And I do ask Andrea, uh, she's going to be following the chat. I would appreciate if she just lets me know if something comes in. So we'll go ahead and get started here. So uh, the first thing that we want to uh, make you aware of as far as a change in the system is, um, as Pat had said with, with uh, USAS, the districts are going to have the capability of submitting their own files if deemed uh, by you, you as well as the district, that that's what, how they're going to do it. Um, what we're suggesting is you as the ITC come up with a plan. I don't know if you're going to have some sort of a document or what you want to do, just so you can, you know what districts are going to be submitting their own data, or if you as an ITC say, nope, we're submitting everyone's data, that's not a problem. But you have to have some sort of a plan to know, you know, what does what the district is going to be doing because you don't want a submission file to get omitted and not get sent. You know, whether it be the district was supposed to send it, or if you were supposed to send it, but you didn't realize that the district wasn't going to send it. So you need to make some sort of coordination with the districts to know your for your peace of mind as well as the districts who's going to be doing the submissions of the files. So with that being said, um, if a district is going to be submitting their own data, um, we do have a configuration out under system, under the configuration tab. It's a W2 configuration. And I'm actually gonna skip down because I added this screen kind of last minute. Uh, let me go through here, I gotta find it. Where are you? Maybe I already passed. Here we go. Okay, so what the district will have, to, or the ITC or district has to do is you have to go into the system configuration. Let me just pull, I have a, a, a demo instance up here. I think I'm just going to pull it over and show you. It's a lot easier. So under system configuration, if you went down to the W2 configuration option, just like in USAS, we have this district will submit on W2 files. If you agreed with the district that they're going to be submitting their own files, then this, this option has to be checked. And with that being said, if they're going to be submitting their own files, the data on this setup needs to be populated as well, because this is what um, helps create the header record for the tape file. So all of that data needs to be populated correctly. Uh, there is a submitter EIN information as well as submitter user ID. Um, I think Michelle had sent out an email a while back regarding um, if they if districts plan on submitting their own W-2s, they have to go out to the BSO, which is the business services online for the SSN, and they have to get an account set up, and they will actually be given a submitter EIN. Um, that way, they'll be able to enter that information in here when they're getting ready to create um, this uh, configuration record or with your assistance however you're planning on doing it. 
So again, if they're going to submit their own data, this has to be populated, has to be filled out, and the box needs to be checked in order for them to be able to create their own submission file. So if they've got, if they're going to be creating their own submission file, if they go into the W-2 report and submission option, and let's just say they want to create the SSN file or SSN, the SSA file, they're going to go in, go into the W-2 report option, click the submission bubble, and then you're going to see down here. This hasn't been released yet. It's going to be released today, but I wanted you to be aware of it. Um, if the districts are submitting their own data, they're going to be seeing um, extra boxes at the bottom, which are submission uh, file summary reports. So what that's going to give them is a summary of if they have employees that are FICA, it's going to give them a line with all the FICA information as far as like the total um, total uh, withheld for FICA, Medicare, et cetera. So let me just go in. I think I have, uh, like, yeah, have data in this file. So I'll just try to run this so you can take a look at it. Shouldn't take too long. But those options are only going to be visible if the district is submitting their own data. If the, if the district is not submitting their own data and the and USAITC are submitting it, none of those uh, submission file summary report options will be available. And those, those report options are available under all the tabs, the report options tab, the W2 city option tab, and the W2 state options tab. So they would be able to see all of those and create a report for all of those. And here is an example of what that summary um, report looks like. Like I said, it just tells you how many employees were processed, the FICA wages, um, wages, other compensation, uh, the federal income taxes withheld, FICA withheld, Medicare withheld, um, and the Medicare wages, and then dependent care benefits, and also gives you file totals as well. So I just kind of wanted to show you that because that is something that we're going to be releasing, I believe it'll be today, and it'll be on the 627 release. So you have that information. Um, let me get out of here. Go back to the PowerPoint. If I can, no, get that over there. All right. Um, again, like we had just talked about, the districts now have the option or the capability of creating their own submission file and submitting it if they if they choose. Um, let me move this out of the way. There we go. That's bothering me. Okay. Um, and again, here are just some screenshots of what we just saw on that, uh, those screens on that demo screen that I showed you. <clears throat> so if the district wants to create uh, the SSA submission file or a CCA submission file or a RITA submission file, they're gonna have to go to W2 reports and then under that W2 report and submission, and then go to the W2 report option, that tab that we saw on the screen earlier. And when they go in and do that, they have to make sure that they populate a contact name, a contact phone number, and a contract email address. They will see those fields are, are um, in red. So they will have to make sure that that information is populated. Whoops, I'm sorry. Kind of. Oh, I'm skipping all over here. Okay, there we go. So they have to make sure that those fields get populated in order for that to process. If they don't have anything, any data in those fields on those contact fields, they will get an error telling them that that has to be um, popular or has to be populated in order for the process to work. Um, another option, which is new this year, is going to be um, creating state files. So we we have have it set up that districts now have the capability of creating state submission files for surrounding states, um, such as Kentucky, Indiana, West Virginia, Michigan. Um, I'll go ahead and pull this back over so we can take a look at the state option. And you can see here the, in the bubble. So whichever state they're going to be processing a submission file for, they're going to go ahead and click on, let's just say they're going to do Indiana. All right. Um, with these states, the districts have to remember that each state is a little 
maybe a little unique. There are a, a few states that require additional information or other information besides what's on other state uh, records. So perfect, exa perfect example is this Indiana. Indiana requires a taxpayer ID, which you the district, the ITC or the district, sorry, not the ITC, the district would be able to get that information from the state of Indiana, or they probably already have that information if they've been withholding the Indiana tax. So they would have to make sure that they populate that taxpayer ID information. That's like a 10 digit number. And they also have to enter in a, a TID location, which is a three digit number. And again, this is something that they probably would be getting from the state of Indiana. Um, we or you as the ITC would not really have privy to that information. So they would have to get that from them. And because we had the uh, configuration marked as this district is going to be submitting their own data, you can see that I have a Generate Indiana W-2 submission file summary report option available. So if I wanted to create this report, I could do that. And then I could go ahead and create my Indiana submission file as well. Um, Kentucky, same thing. We have um, just the contact information needs to be populated there. There are really no other fields like Indiana that, that are required. Um, Michigan is the same way, just the contact information. But we have the Ohio, so now they can create their own Ohio submission file. And Ohio is very similar. It's got the same thing as far as the contact information. Pennsylvania is just like it was last year. Uh, last year, we had to add Pennsylvania. Um, so you can see uh, that's pretty much the same as it was last year, except for the fact that we now have that submission file summary report. But we do still allow the, the district to create the submission file, as well as that Pennsylvania CSV transmittal file. They need to have that transmittal file uh, because that does have to be uploaded to the, um, the ETIs. That's the name of their, um, process, their processing center or their processing for, for W-2s. So they have to have that information as well. And then we have West Virginia. And West Virginia is a little different because they do require some different information. Obviously, the contact information is still required, but you can see that they also want the first quarter tax due, second quarter tax due, third quarter tax due, fourth quarter tax due, and then the total tax due information entered in here. And you can see we have the same options available as far as creating the submission file, as well as the submission summary report. So those are going to be your options for the state reporting now. We do have, like I said, we have five surrounding states as well as the state of Ohio that you can create the submission files for. And then we all, you all, the district will also have the capability of creating a uh, city submission file as well. Um, and you can see here that we have a tax entity code that's obviously going to be used in order to create uh, that particular city file. So they have to make sure you know, that they enter that information in that tax entity code field. And as you can see, again, we have the submission file option as well as the submission file summary report option. All right, I'm gonna kind of scroll down here because I've gone through a lot of this stuff, but um, this just kind of briefly goes over everything we just discussed as far as like, um, certain states require certain data to be populated. I added that to the slides. So that way you can have that information available to you or your districts. And then this is just talking about creating the Pennsylvania taxes, which we kind of went over already. But I will kind of put a little caveat in there that um, when they generate the Pennsylvania CSV transmittal file during the first year that, that they convert it to the redesign. So let's just say you have a district that does uh, report to Pennsylvania for taxes and they actually convert it over within this year. During this year, um, quarter amounts are gonna have to manually be added to the file that gets created. Um, so a template file is going to be generated with placeholders. And then in those placeholders, you can enter those values in. 
And then also the counts for 1099, they're also going to have to be manual at, manually added because we don't have that information accessible. So there is some manual entry that has to be done on that file. It does get created, but again, the district will have to do some manual inputting on that file in order to get the correct data in there. Um, another thing new, which we've all heard and talked about over this last few months is the Family First uh, Coronavirus Response Act, which is the FFCRA. Um, basically, districts can report um, data on the W-2 using Box 14 um, for any, any wages that were paid because the employee was off. So there's three different options. We have the self option, which is the employee can be off for two weeks, up to 80 hours, um, and they, you, you, they use paid sick leave. So you paid them their regular rate of pay while they were off. Um, you can, you, the district right, really should be tracking this information, keeping track of like what they were paid throughout or you know, how, whatever they were off for that. Uh, or that COVID time. And then what, um, what is going to happen is that data, you know, like I said, you'll be tracking it on a spreadsheet, whatnot. Um, we also have the capability, you're going to also have the option to uh, enter in other information on box 14 for the W-2, which is um, two weeks off, up to 80 hours, a paid sick leave at two thirds of the employee's regular rate. And that would be because they were unable to work because um, they needed to care for an individual who might've been quarantined. So maybe a child, um, their daycare is, is closed up because of COVID or their school is closed because of COVID and they had to stay home with them. That would be a, a, an option for others. So like I said, they're getting two thirds of their pay um, for two weeks. And then we have a third option, which is an emergency option, which would allow for up to 10 additional weeks to be off um, through the uh, paid expand, expanded family medical leave. Um, again, this would be a two thirds of the employee's regular pay. And uh, same, same purpose, same reason would be because uh, their daycare is closed and they have to what, take care of their child or um, their school is closed, they have to take care of their child. Those would be reasons that they would have to be off because of COVID. So with that being said, we now have the options out there on the federal record, on the 001 record that districts can input or they can mass load dollar amounts that were paid to these employees because of COVID you know, through this time. So they could, like I said, manually enter the information um, using adjustments, or they can actually go in and create a spreadsheet and upload it using, it, using adjustments. Um, we have all the information out there on documentation as far as like what fields are required for the mass loading. Um, and then there are, there are restrictions as far as like how much they can pay the employees per day. So like if they're off because for their own purpose, for their for themselves, the max is $511 limit per day. If they're off because of others, the max is a $200 limit per day. And if they're off because of the emergency uh, family leave, um, they could take off up to 10 weeks. And I don't remember if there was a dollar limit. It's probably the same $200 limit because I know it's a two thirds of pay. So my guess is it's probably that $200 limit. Um, I wanted to make you aware that uh, you're tracking the data obviously via spreadsheet and then you're gonna manual enter it or upload it using mass load to the federal record. So basically you're going to be using the adjustments because we have all those fields out of the adjustments and you can actually manually load them onto the federal record. But we wanted to make you aware that the data only will appear on the W-2 report when they're processing. So if you entered or mass entered adjustment information in for COVID, when you process the W-2 report, you're going to see that COVID information on there. 
on there as well as um, the employee will see it on box 14 on their W-2. But the data is not submitted on the tape file. So it's going to need to be reported. There's a worksheet the IRS has out there for the 941 that you're going to have to report that information on in order to get it reported correctly. And one thing just to remember, um, a lot of districts, um, they don't qualify for that reimbursement because they don't withhold uh, FICA taxes. And a majority of this reimbursement is because of the FICA taxes. So just keep that in mind. But um, as I said, nothing gets submitted on the submission file. You have to fill out that worksheet and then that information has to be used for the 941. Um, and then one, another thing to keep in mind as far as the box 14 on the W-2, um, this, it works just like the vehicle lease does. So um, box 14 will allow them, I think you could enter in like six different codes, you know, uh, payroll item codes. But if a district has anything in for COVID, um, any of those, you know, self, other, or emergency, if you have any of those options in, it will use all three of those options before it uses any other any other codes. But we have to remember that if a, if a district has an employee who has vehicle lease information, as well as COVID information, so let's just say that they have vehicle lease and all three of the COVID uh, fields populated, on the W-2 and Box 14, only three, so uh, the vehicle lease, the self, the COVID self, and the COVID other are going to appear on the W-2 in Mac, using Mac 14, because that's how it's always worked with the vehicle lease. Only three populate on there. So whatever is, is there, um, you know, like I said, if you have vehicle lease in the all three COVIDs, you're only going to get three. You're going to get the vehicle lease and two COVIDs. But if you have three COVIDs, all three COVIDs are going to appear before any other, you know, maybe they want, they include union dues or, you know, some other payroll item. If they have COVID data entered in, all three of the COVIDs are going to appear and the union dues will not appear, just so you know that. Um, another change that we've made is on the W-2 report, the warning messages are now grouped with the errors and the info messages. We had some, uh, a Jerry issue, I believe, for that. So we kind of updated it. So we got all these warning messages and they're now grouped with the errors and the info errors, just so you know that. And then here's just a screenshot of the W-2 report and how the errors look for an employee as far as the info, the warning, and the, and the fatal error. And then one more uh, new thing, and this is going to be coming out, um, I believe, on the release, the 627 release as well. Um, we uh, have removed the position code 509, which was for a linkage coordinator assignment. Um, another thing that is uh, being has been removed is the high, highly quali high qualified professional development option that's no longer being reported for EMIS purposes. So that's been removed. And then we also removed the EMIS appointment type four, which was for a six hour lay teacher. So just keep that in mind that that information has been removed. So those are just the changes that are kind of going to be, have taken place or are taking place for uh, 2020 as of right now. Um, obviously, if we get other changes or something major happens before the end of the year, we will definitely release that and let you know right away. Um, so now we'll go ahead and we will pull up the calendar year in review. Let's get the slideshow going here. Maybe. Come on. Here we go. Guess I got to click the right button. Okay. All right, um, the filing deadline. So January 31st is the deadline to file the W-2 uh, submission files on the Business Services Online, the BSO, um, or to submit uh, paper W-2 forms. 
Um, again, if that falls on a Saturday or Sunday or a legal holiday, the deadline will be the next business day. But looking at my calendar, looks like December 31st is a Thursday. So uh, I'm looking at December. I gotta look at, I gotta look at 2021. And like Pat had said, I think that it might be on a Sunday. So it's possible it might be due the next day, which would be February 1. Um, but uh, January 31st is the deadline that the employees have to have their W-2 file or forms. So you gotta make sure that districts make are aware and make sure that those uh, W-2s are sent out to the employees or given to the employees in plenty of time. So they have them by the end of, of January. Um, another thing you wanna keep in mind as the ITC, you wanna make kind of coordinate. So you, if you are going to be submitting your district files um, you let the districts know, hey, you have to have your file to me by January, you know, 26th or whatever, just whatever makes it most convenient for you as the ITC. That way you, you're sure to have all of your district files that you need to have before you append all that information uh, into one file for submission. So just keep that in mind. Um, Oops, hold on here, I'm going too far. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we still don't have a W-2 mate program in redesign yet. So there's a couple, a few different options that can be used for districts as far as like um, verifying social security numbers for their employees. Um, what they could do is if, if it's a newly, uh, newly imported district, maybe they just started, you know, within the last few months or even within this year. If they wanted to, they could go out to Classic and just put that employee information in and create a file using W-2 main. They could do it that way. Um, the other option would be um, they could run W-2 main in Classic and then anybody that came in uh, to the district after they went live and redesign uh, call that employee information into the SSA for uh, uh, the SSM verification. So in reality, they could, uh, you know, create the file in Classic, but then call in to the SSA for verification of, of, of an SSN that is not on the file if they wanted to do that. Or the district can create a spreadsheet using uh, the employee grid. And I have listed on here all of the fields that would need to be pulled in. But there is some manual work that needs to be done because there are a couple of other um, columns that need to be on, or yeah, columns that need to be on that file. We have a TPB entry code that needs to be on there as well as a 214 processing code and also uh, the file requester data, OEVS 000. Um, so I kind of put in a sample of what, it, what the report, you know, what it looks like on the report. Um, and then I actually gave you the link for the SSA specs for the file setup. So you could go in and create a report from the redesign using that information. But like I said, there is some manual entry that would have to be done as far as entering in that entry code and processing code and that requester data. So just keep that in mind. And we do have a feedback issue out there to create a, pro a program like W2Mate for uh, SS SSN verification. And that uh, JIRA issue is USPSR FB 374. I'm becoming dyslex dyslexic on Friday the 13th. Okay. Um, some things we want to talk about for pre W 2 processing. Um, we want to have your districts make sure that the OSDI abbreviations for or school district uh, abbreviations are listed on the payroll item configuration record. You wanna make sure that because we need it for proper reporting on the W-2. Um, so they'll just have to go in and verify and make sure that all of the information is on that payroll item configuration record. And here's a screenshot of what I'm referring to. So um, what we suggest is the four digit code and then a uh, brief, uh, brief uh, Name, like the name of the district. So this one is one, two, three, four test. You wanna make sure you have that information because you want that information to appear on the W-2. Another pre-W-2 processing option for cities 
is we want to verify that the entity code is on the payroll item configuration record. And the reason that is important is, remember when we were talking about creating W-2 uh, submission files for cities, it asked for the entity code. It all ties back to that. So we gotta make sure that we have that uh, entity code listed on that payroll item configuration record. And here's a screenshot of the city of a city payroll item configuration record with the tax city code highlighted. They want to make sure that they have that information entered. Uh, so other pre uh, W two reporting pro uh, pre processing would be for CCA and Rita. We want to make sure on the payroll item configuration records that <clears throat> excuse me. The values, the RITA code and the CCA code are, are set <coughs> because those are required for the tax data to be included on the submission file. And um, if districts have more questions about that, they can go out to the RITA or CCA websites um, on the codes at, uh, and you know find that information on those particular websites. And here's a screenshot that we're referring to as far as the RITA description or the RITA code and then the description and then your CCA code and your CCA description. Um, we're going to a little bit more about CCA and RITA. We want to verify the payroll item deduct type value is reported correctly on the city payroll item. So if they're uh, working in the city because of employment, we got to make sure it's marked as such or because they're working there because they live in that city. We have to make sure that it's marked as such. Um, you can see the following websites for RITA and CCA as far as like uh, if you need more details regarding if they're how they're supposed to report these employees, at regular, whether they're work or paying it because of employment or paying it because of residence. And here is a screenshot of the, the city record, and then there is your deduction type. And again, that has to be populated for RITA or CCA uh, records. Another record that we are adding to this this year is um, if you are on the bordering of Indiana and you have districts that pay into, have employees at districts with employees that pay into Indiana, they may have a state tax as well as a county tax. So they set that county tax record up as a city tax record. Um, but you will, we want to make sure that we have a tax entity code listed for that Indiana tax, for that county tax. So again, that information is probably going to have to be um, received from the state of Indiana as far as that, that code that needs to be entered. Um, as far as state taxes, so in your payroll item configuration records, we have to make sure that the state ID field is populated for all of those surrounding states that we're going to be, you're going to possibly be creating a submission file for. So we want to make sure that that information is out there and populated before we try to create the submission file. So again, make sure any West Virginia, Kentucky, Indiana, Michigan, and Pennsylvania records, if, any, if you have any districts that have any of those states, make sure that their state ID field is populated. Another pre-processing uh, option that we have to follow is for the HSA, we want to make sure that the annuity type on the payroll item configuration is set to other, even if there is no employee miles that are being withheld, you still have to make sure that is that is set to other. And here's a screenshot of your HSA payroll item configuration record and the annuity type set to other. More pre-processing uh, would be expense reimbursement. And out on the wiki, we do have a document talking about expense reimbursements, it goes through several different scenarios. Um, but if a district wants to uh, wants to have amounts that were paid through warrant to appear on the W-2 as wages, 
again, you can look at this document that we have out there and it gives you all different kinds of scenarios and maybe, and it tells you like what things have to be adjusted in the redesign and adjustments as far as um, getting it processed and getting it put on the W-2. Um, excludable moving expenses are for active military only. So it probably pretty much does not apply to anyone at your districts, but we have this included on here just in case for some reason they do have an active military uh, employee and they're paying moving expenses. Um, the reimbursements are uh, including payments made directly to a third party for active military employees only. So that's basically what this would be. So if they, if you do have a district that has that, any type of moving expense information would be entered in on the adjustment screen. And we advise uh, districts to contact their legal advisor if they have questions regarding that. And here's a screenshot of the adjustment journal and your, your uh, moving expenses option. The fringe benefit amounts, Again, we advise districts to talk to their legal advisor if they have a lot of questions or have any questions regarding if this should be reported as fringe benefits. Um, the district can again use the adjustment screen to enter in the fringe benefit amounts. Um, example tuition reimbursement, uh, anything above 5250 is considered a fringe benefit and it's subject to be taxed. So the amount above 52.50 paid for tuition would go in the adjustments under the federal tax payroll item under the fringe benefit type. So if you're in adjustments, you're going to put in the amount above the 52.50 to pay for that tuition reimbursement. And again, here's a screenshot of the adjustment journal and the fringe benefit type being used. And this just talks about when you, say, when you click the save button, um, it updates the total and taxable grows for any payroll item that taxes fringe benefits. So if you went in and added a federal, a federal fringe benefit op record, it's going to update the federal, the state, and again, any other payroll item that taxes fringe benefits. And that's going to be reflected on the W-2 report and the W-2 form. Life insurance purchase for withheld annuities. Um, this basically is for the life insurance that is over $50,000. And normally the board pays for this from employees or an employee. So what a district can do or what they will want to make sure they do is before their last pay in December, they could actually do it right now if they wanted to. But before that last pay in December, they want to go in, they could go into current or future and then enter in the amount um, for life insurance premium. So um, to do that, there is a calculation that has to be used. I think it's in, um, yeah, the IRS publication 15B, uh, section two, pages 13 through 15. And um, there, there is a calculation table to, uh, to help the district figure out the costs of the life insurance. So when they figured that information out, they can use current or future to enter that life insurance uh, pay type information in with that dollar amount that they calculated. <clears throat> Keep in mind that the pay type, the life insurance pay type is treated diff differently for, for taxing purposes. Um, so the tax amounts for Medicare and Social Security are calculated when the payroll is initialized and it, they will be withheld accordingly. But no federal uh, or Ohio or school district tax is calculated. All of those are treated according to the federal rules. So basically the life insurance information is included in the taxable gross, but it's not withheld during the payroll process. Um, uh, the, uh, the software also does provide the ability to withhold city taxes on non-cash earnings. So this life insurance is considered a non-cash earning. So if an employee pays into city taxes and that city 
um, taxes, non-cash earnings, you want to make sure that non-cash earnings flag is set to yes on that city record. And then that will be included in the process when the, uh, the payroll is processed for that city. Now, like we said, you want to make sure you get all this entered in either now or before the last pay of December, because if you if the district does not get this entered in, then they have to go in and make adjustments because they did not enter that information before that last pay of December was processed. So if the life insurance wasn't used prior to the last pay, there's a manual procedure that can be used in order for the life insurance to show up on the W-2 form um, and, ensure, it, and to ensure that it balances with the quarter report. So you're gonna to wanna to follow the procedures that we have listed here prior to generating the W-2 forms. So what they're gonna do is go into the adjustments record and then they're gonna create a record. They're gonna find the employee and they're gonna choose the federal, the 001 record and they're gonna choose the type life insurance, enter in a transaction date and the amount. So here's a screenshot of what they're going to be entering in. And then when they click that save button, it's going to update that total and taxable gross fields for any of the payroll items that tax life insurance. So again, federal, state, school district, city, and Medicare. Once you create the 001 record uh, with the life insurance, it will actually update all federal, state, school district, and city for that life insurance premium. And that, that is going to be reflected on the W-2. Um, the only bad thing that doesn't happen is because you're doing it after the payroll processing is done and you're making manual adjustments, no Medicare is withheld. So with that being the case, the district is either going to, they have a couple options. Um, either the district, the board can pay the full Medicare for the employee and the employer. A lot of times it's already uh, an employee that has pickup anyway. So they're just gonna pay all the Medicare anyway. Um, they could they could pay employees and employer amount, or they could ask the employee for that amount, and then the board will pay their amount. So there are several different ways that they can do that, but that's up to the district how they want to handle that. And then that information also needs to be processed on the Medicare adjustment record as far as the withholding, because if you don't process that um, as withholding on the Medicare record, more than likely you're gonna get errors on the W-2 report because the, uh, the amount withheld does not equal 1.45% of the taxable gross. Um, dependent care, um, if the district doesn't use a dependent care payroll item option because we have a dependent care payroll type, payroll item type, but if they do not use that, they can manually enter dependent care amounts through adjustments. Um, they could just go into adjustments and uh, on the federal record, add the, um, the dependent care option. Um, note that the max is $5,000 for married filing joint or, or unmarried couples or single and single, which is a $2,500 max uh, and they're married filing separate. So what they could do is go in and click on the create option under uh, adjustments. And then they'll go in and enter that information on the screen. So you can see that um, this example that I'm giving, um, the person has $6,000 for dependent care. Well, the max is only 5,000. So what happens is any amount above the $5,000 threshold that you put in dependent care is going to be reflected on the W-2. So $1,000 is going to be added uh, for that total dependent care amount in box 10 on the W-2. So just keep that in mind. We talked kind of about company vehicle a little bit earlier, but um, this is another thing as far as uh, pre-processing goes. If uh, a district has an employee who has a vehicle lease, they use a company vehicle, um, they could go in and actually enter in the calculated lease vehicle value using the adjustment screen. 
Again, here's a screenshot of what that would look like on, in the adjustments record. <clears throat> and then when they click the save button in the adjustments, that's gonna update the total and taxable gross for any payroll item that taxes vehicle lease. So again, once they create the federal record for vehicle lease, it's going to update your federal, your state, anything that taxes um, vehicle lease. And again, that's going to be reflected on the W-2, but that's going to be put in box 14. So that is one of those uh, basically mandatory fields that go in box 14 on the W-2. Um, the Affordable Care Act uh, required employers to report the, co the cost of health care coverage for employees. So basically, uh, on the payroll, uh, Item, payroll item configuration record, we have that um, box that uh, you can mark that says this you know, is for employer health care. So you may have one for a board and employee. You may have one for board, one for employee. You may have one for employee. Maybe you don't track uh, employer through the payroll. Several different options, several different ways. But you want to make sure that you have that marked for um correct processing and districts by now should have that mark, but in case they uh, came over to the redesign and something happened where it didn't come over, I mean, you want to make sure that that record is marked or that box is marked on that record, the payroll item configuration record. So that information gets uh, pulled for W-2 reporting purposes. Um, so basically the IRS wants to uh, report uh, anybody that has 250 or more W-2s from the uh, preceding calendar year, they want that information reported for health insurance. And that's going to be put in with the code of DD on the W-2. Now, keep in mind that this is for employee and employer because it's very deceiving when you say employer-sponsored health coverage. A lot of times districts think, oh, well, that's just what the employer paid. No, it's what the employee and employer paid combined. So just keep that in mind. And then here's a screen, a screenshot of uh, the payroll item uh, configuration record. Here is that employer health coverage box that I was referring to. Um, keep in mind that life, life, dental, and vision are not required to be reported unless they are included as part of the medical plan. But if they're separate, they do not need to be included as part of, as part of the employer health coverage. Um, I have a link to the W-2 reporting of employer-sponsored health coverage if anybody wants to look at that. <clears throat> and then again, this all this, whoops, hold on. Another thing I wanted to make sure that you're aware of is the contributions amounts that were made by an employee and employer for health savings accounts. Do not confuse the two. We've got employee employer health coverage. We've got employee employer health savings accounts. Health savings accounts are not considered employer health coverage. So if you have separate payroll item configuration records set up for HSAs, you do not want that box employer health coverage marked on your HSAs because those are treated differently on the W-2. Those go in box 12 with the code of W. So we got to make sure that you define those two separately. Oh, I'm going, ah, hold on here. I'm going crazy. Okay. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about employer health coverage box that's on the payroll item configuration record. So if it's on a regular record or an annuity record, uh, plus if there are any adjustments out there for health insurance, those are all used to calculate the employer-sponsored health care cost. So that is all combined together and that's used for that employer-sponsored health care cost. If the uh, employer health, co health coverage box is checked, the year-to-date payroll item totals will be included in the total move to the employee W-2 for employer health coverage. So keep that in mind. 
Okay. And then again, here, well, here's a screenshot of it. I did have it included in my PowerPoint. Okay. Um, let's just say you have a district that's not currently processing the board portion of the paid medical insurance through the payroll. Um, they can track the employer funds or healthcare portion through payroll if they wanted to. What they can do is they could go in and create a payroll and configuration record for the employer portion and then just leave the object codes blank. That way they're not processing anything through employer distribution or anything like that, but at least they could keep track of it. And then for W-2 reporting purposes, it's a lot easier in the long run than having, than, you know, if, you're, if they're tracking it through a spreadsheet or manually. So this is one way they could process it or, you know, just keep track of it through the payroll system. Um, if the district only tracks the employer por employee portion of the health co care costs, um, then the district's going to need to create a spreadsheet using the appropriate headers. Um, and here's a link to the mass load um, chapter of, pay of our documentation that lists the, the header information. They can use that to load the board year to day cost for employee health insurance to the adjustments. They would have to add that to adjustments in order for that to go on to the, um, the, uh, the payroll item. And to do that, like I said, the, once they have their CSV file created, they can use the mass load option under utilities. And they're going to load this into the adjustment screen. And uh, that will actually then load that data into the that, uh, that uh, adjustment, the amount of payroll item data that wasn't tracked in the payroll system into the adjustment journal. Sorry, I kind of lost my train of thought there for a minute. So here's a screenshot of the um, utilities, the mass load option. And here's just a couple little facts. If an employee is paying for their insurance out of pocket, the amount may be added as follows. So maybe they, over the summer months, they pay for their insurance out of pocket. Uh, the district could go to core adjustments and do a create and then find their employee and then use the drop down to find the federal tax record. And then they could you choose the, the health insurance type and put it in a transaction date and then the dollar amount that they have paid for the health insurance. And you could enter a description in as far as like, you know, uh, summer, summer, you know, premium payment or something. And then they would save that record. Another thing, if the employee is uh, pays half of the year out of pocket and the other half through payroll, the amount the, the employee paid can be added. So again, using that same process, using adjustments and using the health insurance type, you could go in and enter that information in. Again, another screenshot of what that would look like in the adjustment screen. When that save button is, is clicked, it's going to update the total employer health coverage. Uh, so code DD withheld for W-2 reporting purposes. Because again, it's using adjustments, it's using the payroll items, it's using all that information to pull that data in for the W-2. Um, let's see, we already talked about this. Oh, the spreadsheet can be updated with the appropriately formatted data using utilities, BASO, which we talked about, and you're going to enter into the, the federal payroll item code uh, using the type health insurance. Again, if you're updating the health insurance for an employee, you're gonna use that information and that will go into that federal record. Um, there was last year, this was introduced, uh, and this is a, another pre-W-2 uh, process that districts can do if they qualify. Um, I can't really feature too many school districts will call, qualify for this, unless maybe they're a community school um, and they have a very small amount of employees, but this qualified small employer health reimbursement arrangement um, is set up to reimburse um, 
medical care expenses, expenses for eligible employees. Um, so if that's the case, you would have to go in and use adjustments for the health reimbursement uh, to basically enter that information so it gets reported on the W-2. And again, this is only if a district has 50 or less full-time em employees. So as I said, most districts probably aren't going to be uh, using this unless it's a community school or something like that that doesn't offer health insurance. But if you do have someone that does qualify for the health reimbursement, this is the information they're going to have to use in order to get that health reimbursement information on the W-2 with the code of FF. And then here's just a screenshot of the core adjustment screen for the health reimbursement option. Okay, the W-2 report and the submission features that are out in re, uh, payroll redesign are used to generate a, re a report, which can be used for balancing. It's used to create the XML file, which is used for your laser printing. And then it's used to create the W-2 tape submission files for uh, the reporting. So there's several different options available under that W-2 report option. So if a district is ready to just process the W-2 report to start balancing, and like I said, they can start doing this now because they're just running the report. And a lot of times we've told districts or ITCs as well, tell your districts, hey, uh, maybe at the end of every month or at the end of every quarter, run the W-2 report just to make sure there's no errors being produced. That way they can keep it cleaned up and they don't have to worry about it at the end of the year when they're running it and they've got like a gazillion errors that they have to try to figure out what those errors are, are from. Um, they can run this report, you know, as many times as they want to. So at this point, they could even start running it right now for calendar year end to get start getting ready for calendar year end reporting. Um, that you'll notice that, that there's uh, the output type is, is report, uh, the format type, they can choose what type they want, the report title can be changed if they want to change that. The federal ID and state ID numbers come from the, uh, they're defaulted and they come from the core organization records. They do have to populate the kind of employer. Most school districts are state employers, so it would be an S. Um, unless for some reason they are um, not are exempt, then they would have to use a different code. But most most districts use the code S. Um, but it, uh, if they don't use the code S, again, that that option could be changed with the the drop down box that's there. The sorting options district can choose that. The current year will default, so it should show as twenty twenty. Um, and they're going to generate the report, and then they're going to balance their to-date data, and then they're going to go and make sure and review and correct any warnings or errors. If they want to make sure that they start doing this now. That way, when they're getting ready to process W-2s, they're not bombarded with so many problems. Um, additional deduction codes are allowed for Box 14, like we discussed earlier. I think they can enter up to six. Uh, vehicle lease and COVID are definitely ones that will be mandatory. They'll be on the W-2 no matter what. But if the district also puts in other payroll item codes and an employee doesn't have vehicle lease or COVID, any of those codes, then those payroll item codes will appear on the W-2. Like I said, maybe it's union dues or, you know, some fund that they're paying into. Now that can, that'll just appear on the W-2 for that employee. Um, information of the uh, the W on the W two report should balance to your nine forty one total as reported. Um, there are also the earnings register. You want to run that earnings register for the calendar year. Want to balance? Make sure those totals balance. Also the quarter report. Make sure those totals balance. So you balance your federal, your state, your city, and all of your gross amounts. You want to make sure all of those are balanced. Um, here's just a screenshot of a reconciliation form. And again, we have this reconciliation form out there um, on the wiki in that documentation under the supporting documents. We have that sitting out there as well. Here's 
here's just a screenshot of the earnings register. And basically we're saying the amounts in, in the employee amount column sh should uh, be used for balancing purposes. We're telling you which column you're going to be using when you're trying to do your balancing. And then your quarter report, the year to date total on the quarter report should be used for balancing. And on the W-2, the tax withheld column should be used for balancing. Um, we're gonna talk about items that may affect your balancing. So keep these things in mind when you're trying to balance your reports. Um, these items will affect your balancing between your W-2 report and your quarter report. Um, we have a document out there, another supporting do document is called uh, Specific Effects. You look at that document, it talks greatly about these different things and what it what they actually affect on the reports. So that's a really good document to look at. But these things again will may cause, well, I should say may not say may, will cause balancing differences between your W-2 report and quarter report. Uh, dependent care benefits that were over the limit of five thousand dollars for married, filing separate, or twenty five hundred single. Your fringe benefits. Medicare pickup amounts, taxable third-party sick pay, use of a company vehicle, uh, your COVID amounts, your employee expense reimbursement paid through warrant, so um, I, don't know. I don't know why I got that back down there again. Oh, I went the wrong way. That's why. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So dependent care benefits. We'll talk about that a little bit. So. Um, if, like I said earlier, if $6,000 was added in the adjustments in the dependent care field on the 001 record, $1,000 is going to get added to the total taxable gross fields because of the um, overage. It's, it's over the limit of $5,000. So that's going to get added to that total taxable gross field. So what's going to happen is it's going to make the W-2 report a gross amount appear higher than the quarter report does. Your fringe benefits, same thing. If you add a fringe benefit information on that federal record, it's going to actually cause that gross amount on the W-2 to look higher than the quarter report. You'll notice a trend here. Anything that you manually enter through adjustments for W-2 purposes normally always makes the W-2 appear higher than the quarter report. Quarter report, the reason, the reason being that didn't get processed through the payroll. So it's not on the quarter report, it's only on the W-2 report. Medicare pickup amounts, again, that's another thing that's going to cause a discrepancy between the W-2 report and your quarter report. Your W-2 report is going to look higher. Uh, the tax employer amounts option, whoops, hold on here, where do we go? Oh, I'm skipping things here. Medicare pickup, okay, there we go. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind too, um, we have a tax employer amounts option on the city records, on the payroll item configuration record. So if the tax employer amounts box is unchecked for a city on the payroll item configuration record, um, the Medicare box should be pick, be checked if the city taxes Medicare pickup. So. If they tax Medicare pickup, if this city taxes Medicare pickup, you gotta make sure you have that box checked. The Medicare pickup is added to the city total and taxable gross amount on the W-2. So if you have the Medicare pickup box checked, but the tax employer amounts box is unchecked, what's gonna happen is the employee's gonna be paying their taxes after the fact. It's not going to be withheld during the payroll. So here are those boxes that I'm referring to, your Medicare pickup and your tax employer amounts. So if the tax employer amount is used on the city tax record, so basically that box is checked and you have the Medicare box checked, the tax are going to be withheld during the payroll. So every time the payroll is processed, the Medicare pickup amount gets taken into consideration and it also gets taxed during the payroll. So that employee will not have to pay those taxes after the fact when they file their W-2. There is taxable third-party sick pay. 
Um, the user needs to add any taxable third-party sick pay amounts through adjustments uh, using the total gross and, and uh, taxable gross uh, features for the federal record, the school, the Ohio record, and the school district record. Again, if you when you enter the third-party data, it's going to make the W-2 report appear higher than the quarter report. We have um, supporting documents out there as far as the instructions, how you enter, what you need to do. And we also have an example document of what you might be receiving, what your district might be receiving from the third party uh, vendor, what it will be on the document. So here are a couple screenshots of the adjustment journals as far as like what needs to be updated. The total and taxable gross, like I said, on the federal, the state, and school district if it, if you know that if they pay into school district if a district has an employee who had non taxable third party sick pay that will not affect your balancing between your w2 report and your quarter report um, it doesn't affect any taxes um, you basically just go in and add uh, the amount through adjustments to the third party pay on the federal tax record uh, the district should be notified how much that non-taxable amount is by the third party vendor, because that is processed differently on the W-2, it's put in box 12, but that is used as a code of J. So they kind of have to know if it's taxable or non-taxable third party sick pay. Okay, we talked about this a little earlier, so, but if the district wants the employee reimbursement originally paid through a warrant to appear on the W-2 as wages and adjustments are made, it's going to, to create a difference in the balancing between your quarter report and your W-2 report. Again, your W-2 report is going to show higher gross amounts that were actually paid in payroll because of the manual adjustments that were made. Again, see that in, uh, expense reimbursement document under supporting documents for more details. Um, another thing that causes balancing issues could be the company vehicle uh, lease information. So because you manually went and you added that through in adjustments to the federal record, um, the total and taxable gross fields on the federal, state, et cetera, are going to appear higher on the W-2 report that they are going to look on the quarter report. Balancing problems. So if districts have balancing issues, a couple of things that they can look at. Um, first thing they might wanna do is check for any voided checks from a prior calendar year. So what they could do is go into payments to the check register on the grid, and then they could use the issue date, which would be the pay date, and enter the beginning date to the ending date. So like put in the date and then two dots and then to the ending date. And then go in to the status and filter on the status of V. So that's going to pull in all the voided checks that were dated between 1-1 of 20 through 12-31 of 20. That's one way they could find that. And then they could generate a report using the report option right from the grid to do that. Um, to pull out refund of annuities withheld in the prior calendar year. <clears throat> they could go to payments, go to refund checks, and uh, show reissue date on the grid, and then filter again from the beginning of the year, 1-1 one, one of 20 through 12-31 of 20, and click on report. Uh, do the same option on the refund ACH tab. Sorry. Oops, hold on here, what am I doing here? So this was for checks, but then if you wanted to do that for the same for the ACHs, you could do that as well for the refund of ACHs. Um, check for any manual updates. Uh, go to core adjustments, filter the transaction date, filter the code, search for any types manually added. So maybe fringe benefit, health insurance, dependent care, vehicle lease. Um, or you could filter on the codes and filter the type that is out of balance. So you could use your adjustments to actually go out and do some filtering off the grid to find information from there as well. Um, if you have a warning, the calculated annuity amounts exceed the total annuities, 
That tells us that the total gross minus the applicable gross is greater than the total annuities from the year-to-date uh, deduction amounts. So that tells me if there's a problem with the annuity amounts, gross, or the applicable gross. So what you could do is verify um, any manual adjustment updates or verify any error adjustments. And to do that, like I, like I said, you could go to adjustments or you could run an audit report to see if any error adjustments or anything like that were possibly made. Um, error, if you see an error, invalid SSN. Uh, the SSA defines a series of SSS, SSNs as invalid. Uh, so we basically want to make sure that we verify the social security number is correct. So you might have to get the employee's social security card. Or you could go to core employees and use the grid to locate the employee and then click on the edit button and update the social security number with the correct SSN once you determine what it is. So you want to make sure that you have the correct social security numbers. And again, that all kind of flows back to that W-2 main, which we don't have right now in redesign, but there are options, ways to get that information. So this error shouldn't really be an issue because if you were already processed that information and went through and verified and validate all the, the social security numbers, that would be one less thing you have to worry about. Another error could be a Medicare amount does not equal 1.45% of the Medicare gross. So that's basically telling us Medicare tax is incorrect. So the districts will want to verify the amounts um, and, and tell the districts that that really needs to be corrected because the SSA does uh, not normally accept incorrect amounts for Medicare. So that has to be corrected. Uh, what they could do to maybe look at that is verify any manual adjustment updates. So again, go out to adjustments and verify there weren't any uh, manual adjustments made to the Medicare records. Uh, check Medicare pickup records. You gotta make sure that the 692 or 693, which whatever one they use, um, has the employer amount listed as 2.9%. Again, they could run an audit report as well, get information. Another warning is negative annuity on file for the employee. So it says assuming zero. So what that means is the total negative annuity uh, is showing but it, it could be from a check that was voided from a prior calendar year in the current calendar year. So um, the district could run the report uh, payment transaction status report to attempt to isolate the problem. Um, if that is the case, it was, if it was a check voided from a prior calendar year, um, the district could go in and zero the negative uh, annuity amount using adjustments or no, yeah, using adjustments basically make it a wash, zero it out, and then file a W2C form from the previous calendar year. Or if they want to report as withheld and refunded in the current calendar year, they could go into adjustments and zero the annuity amount by entering a positive figure that coincides with that negative figure, just like we did in the first statement. And then use adjustments and increase the total gross amount on the federal, state, school district, and city records if the city honored the annuity initially. So those are ways that they could make that correction. An informational message could be the pension plan flag on the federal record is overriding the W-2 proc calculations. So what that tells us is <clears throat> the uh, federal payroll item box has the pension plan, pension plan flag marked as no. Uh, never check the, the pension plan box, but they find an active retirement record. Or vice versa, uh, the pension plan box is marked automatically check the pension plan box based on retirement or yes. And there is no active retirement record out there. So it's telling you, hey, however you have the box mark and there's no pension, uh, no pension, uh, not pension, no active retirement record listed for that. Um, keep in mind, this is common to receive the information for students who do not participate in um, SERS retirement. So if that's the case, then you don't have to worry about no action is needed, but just keep that in mind. Another informational message is the payroll item, uh, possible error in the school district, gross or taxable gross. Uh, this tells us that <coughs> 
the tax for OSDI wages um, are there, but there's no tax that was withheld. And keep in mind that this is very common for employees that have very small wages amounts in payroll. Uh, the district would just go on and verify the amounts. And then if, it, if that is the case, it's just a very small amount, no action is needed. Nothing needs to be done. Another warning error is federal total annuities does not equal total gross less applicable gross. Um, <clears throat> so what that means is the calculated annuity amount, total gross less applicable gross doesn't match your annuity amounts from the payroll items. So um, the program compares the total annuities from the payroll items to the total gross less taxable gross and it uh, uses the federal tax record. So possible problems could be related to the annuity totals, the total gross totals or the applicable gross totals. The district is gonna to have to try to determine what, what that is, where the air is coming from. Um, so they can verify by going out to adjustments and verifying there were no manual adjustments made or verify uh, any refunds of deduction. Um, if it was from a refund of a, a prior calendar year, the district wants to just make sure that they increase the federal or the total gross on the federal, state, school district, and city taxes or city records if they were honored. And to do that, they can just use the adjustments field in uh, core. They can go in and just use that update. Another error is the employee's Medicare wages are less than their Social Security wages. If you get that error message, the Medicare gross wages is more the amount is probably incorrect, or the FICA gross wages are incorrect. So you're going to have to determine which is incorrect and make uh, adjustments uh, to the, those records that have the incorrect amount. And you're going to do that using the adjustment screen. And again, the district is going to want to make sure if they receive this error, that that error gets corrected before they create the actual tape file. Because as I say, normally once that corrected, they don't want to file with that information being wrong. Okay, and then here's just your W-2 report. Um, it's just a diagram. It shows you like where uh, information comes from. So like the description on the W-2 report comes from the special amounts for W-2s. The tax withheld comes from the payroll items. The taxable gross come from the payroll items as well as the total gross. And then the annuities come from the calculated gross minus taxable gross. So that's kind of just a diagram telling you like where all the information comes from on this report. Okay, uh, W-2 uh, submission files. So when districts know that their W-2 report is good, everything's in balance, and they wanna start creating their submission files, they can go back to W-2 uh, report and submission, and then they're gonna choose the output type submission, and then they're gonna go in, and the federal ID number defaults from the core organization. Uh, if there's an additional federal ID, they could add it if they wanted to. The state ID, again, come from the core organization records, and that is defaulted. Again, they have to go in and enter the kind of employer. And um, I listed the kind of employer information right here, just for your information as well as, as your districts. Um, I'll just go over that. OK. And then obviously, these are all of the options that they have to fill out on that uh, submission file. Make sure they choose their sorting options. The year is defaulted again, as, it, as um, we talked about when they're running the report. The employer name is defaulted. All of the employee information or employer information is defaulted from the organization screen. A district, whoever's processing the, the submission file will have to enter in their contract name, contract, contact name as well as their contact phone number. The phone extension and the fax number are optional, but the email address is also required. So basically the contact name, phone number, and email address are required. The user has to enter that information in. If they don't and they try to process a submission file, they'll get an error telling them that, that those fields were left blank. 
when they are in the W-2 report option on the W-2 report, that W-2 report option tab, they have the capability of creating an SSA file, submission file, and a CCA submission file, and a RITA submission file. <clears throat> if they go to the W-2 city option, they have the, the capability of creating a W-2 city submission file. And again, that's all going to be based on the entity code that they entered in as far as what city they're creating the record for. So here's just a screenshot of what they're going to see when they're going in to create the files. When they go to the W-2 state option, they're going to see those bubbles at the top where they have to choose which state they want to process for. So once they do that, they're going to go in at the bottom then and, and click, you know, generate uh, the state of Michigan submission file, state of Kentucky submission file, whichever bubble they choose because they only choose one bubble at a time. So when they choose that bubble, all the information that needs to be populated for that particular state is there. Um, and anything that is required has, is in red. So they have to make sure that they have that information entered. And then they'll go down to the bottom to create the actual submission files. And then, like I said, Pennsylvania is a little different because they're going to create the submission file. And then they also create the CSV transmittal file as well. If the district wants to create their XML file for their uh, W-2 printing, they're going to, again, go into W-2 report and submission. And for the output type, they're going to choose the XML option. And it, same setup, they go through all the setup information as far as like the ID, the kind of employer, the, the reporting year. And then all, again, the, all the employer information is already defaulted from the organization record. And then they just make sure that they click the generate XML output. Okay, so when they create the XML output or if they create the submission file, if they are not submitting it on their own, they're going to have to make sure that they securely email you the submission file as well as the XML file for printing because ITCs are still required to print the W-2s at this point. We don't have that capability at this point. So the district will need to be aware that they have to securely send you both files because the submission file is going to be used to, you know, to append all of your district file information and send it to the SSA or to the state or wherever else you have to send that information. So you have to make sure that the district send you those files, but securely. You don't want them just emailing it to you, you know, randomly. Um, any specific details on W-2 form reporting requirements are, can be found at the irs.gov uh, pub IRS, and then it's the uh, W-2, W-3 PDF. I actually have that, doc that out in the uh, supporting documentation, so you can pull that up as well. Um, this, I'm not going to go over all of these, but it, it might be beneficial for you or your districts because it kind of tells you where they can locate this information in that IRS documentation. So it talks about uh, if you're making corrections, what page you can find that information on. Um, and it also tells you uh, what you need to use as far as your W2C, et cetera. Where it talks about deceased employees. Um, and as I'm talking about deceased employees, we have an entire document out there under the supporting documents I mean, in the wiki that explains what needs to be done for deceased employees. And we also have um, an article, it's going to be coming up in December's newsletter, I believe, um, kind of just briefly, it's in, a, I think it's a side blur, but it talks about deceased employees and it also gives you that link as well. And it explains what you need to do as far as a uh, deceased employee. Uh, the designated Roth information, employee taxes paid by employer, fringe benefits, group term life insurance, health savings accounts, 
if that uh, if you have lost an employee that lost a W-2, um, what needs to be done? Moving expenses, third party um, expenses. And then it talks about all the different boxes, the box A, B, C, and what is in each one of those fields. We also have another document out there that explains all of the boxes. It talk, you know, it lists every every box and what goes in those boxes. So basically, these are just all of the different boxes that we that are out there for the W-2. The box 12 codes it explains those. And again, we have a supporting document that lists all of those box 12 codes for you in case you want to give that to your districts as that information in it. This is just still all the different codes that go in box 12. Box 13 um, instructions, it talks about that information. As far as, I'm sorry, that's retirement information. I should have specified that. Uh, the box 14, which we've talked about several times today, um, but that again is explained in that document, the IRS document, and um, you can you know, look at that information if you want to. And then your W-3 form, a W-3 form is not required unless you're filing on paper. I don't really know of any districts that still file on paper, but if they do, a W-3 form has to be submitted as well as a W-2 form information. Um, when you do it through the system, a W-3 is automatically created within the file. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, if a district needs to make a correction before the files were submitted to the SSA, um, they can do that. They could just go in, make the corrections, and then they can regenerate a W-2 submission file for 2020. They can, get, they can do that. Unfortunately, if the corrections need to be made after the file has already been submitted to the SSA or by the, by the ITC, um, then the district is going to need to file a W-2C and a W-3C to have uh, that information corrected to, uh, to, the, to the SSA. Now we're getting ready for 2021. Hooray. Maybe that'll be a better year, hopefully. Um, any changes that are going to be affecting city tax with rates will need to be updated in the system as far as your uh, payroll item. Uh, you can use uh, you can, well, well, we'll talk about where to find the information first. So um, city rates are, can be found under the, the, the finderTaxOhio.gov site. I have that site listed. Um, if you have multiple income tax rate database table, you could choose on that. We have school district database. We have school district income tax, uh, the, date, the rate database. You can go in and check all those to verify because if a, a school district or city tax is increasing for 2021, you want to make sure that the withholding is accurate for the employees. So you want to get that changed before your first pay in January. If you have CCA and RITA districts, you can go out to the CCA or RITA website and find the different municipalities and verify your withholding totals, make sure nothing has changed for 2021. If a district isn't sure if an employee is supposed to be taxed or not, maybe they're new, they can go out to this uh, find your tax. They can click on that information for municipality or we have one for school district. I have the links here for both. And then uh, they can look up the tax rate essentially by putting in their address, their zip code. If they're really good and they know the latitude and longitude, they could enter that information in. But I don't know too many that would know that, but hey, you never know. Um, when we're talking about changing the rates for cities or school districts, a couple different options that can be used. We have the mass load option or the mass change option. So if they're gonna use the mass load option, they could go to reports and then uh, go to the custom report creator 
and select the correct object, whether it's annuity, regular, city, whatever they need to be making changes to. And then they're gonna choose the fields they wanna include on their file. And then um, configure the filters as needed. And then they're gonna to wanna to filter the parameters. So because basically they might only wanna specify particular payroll item codes that they wanna change. And then they could choose the format, uh, the Excel field names option. That will give them all the correct field names, the header field names. Then they can click, call, click on generate the report. Then they can update the rates. They can make any necessary changes to those rates that need to be made and save it as a CSV file then. Then they can take that file and go into utilities, mass load, and select the CSV file and then import it to the, uh, in the importable entity that they're, they're making the change to. And they should be able to change the rates that way. Or they could use the mass change option simply by going into the payroll items, filter the code, which they wanted, they're making the change to, and then click the mass change button. And then in the maintenance mode, under description, they could choose the rate option under the script description, the fed definition, sorry. Um, in the new value field, they would enter in the new, the new rate. And under the definition name, give it a definition name. So maybe rate change for 501 and then save that definition. And then they could go in to select the execution mode and under low definition, select that definition that they just created, which is that rate change 501. And then click on the submit mass change option. And then all filtered records that they had out there will be updated with the rate change. Um, not really sure how ITCs feel about doing uh, districts doing mass changes. So again, this is strictly up to the ITC. If they want to make the mass changes themselves, or you want to allow districts to make the mass changes. That's your choice. That's all I really have for the review. Um, do we have any questions? Any questions at all? Andrea, are there any chats out there? I, for some reason, I am not getting the chat box to come up. I've the only on. one that I am questioning, um, I have one, to make corrections to 2020 W-2, will the district have to make December current? That was the last one we had that I didn't get answered Well, yet. the thing, about, no, they wouldn't, have, I don't believe they have to, because the thing is, December is still gonna, still gonna be open, because, well, I mean, if you closed it, you're gonna to have to open it. I would assume we may have. I'm asking Mark to verify that too. Yeah, we're gonna to check with the developers. I'm gonna ask we will them. I'm asking them. because I am not sure if it has to be reopened. A lot of times they don't have to be reopened, but I want to. We want to verify that for sure. So we will double check that to make sure, and we'll let you everybody know that. And again, um, I want to tell you a couple other things out here under the supporting documentation. I added, there is, it's, it's called submitting state tax files. I went out here just, if I can get it to pull up. This kind of goes through like Ohio taxes, West Virginia, all the different taxes. And it just has the links as far as like those, those tax entities. So it kind of helps a little bit for districts that, that do submit to those particular states. So I just wanted to make you aware that that document was out there. And then we, I also put a couple documents in. You may have gotten this earlier. We had um, at one of our prioritization committee meetings, someone had asked about uh, the archive files, putting files out there. And I, so I, uh, Sarah from Namwaka had sent some scripts out and we, uh, she sent them to the people that had asked about it. but. I did put both of those out here just in case someone has a question on those. And then um, as far as like your, uh, your bundles for calendar year on reporting, um, when the district uh, changes posting periods from December to January, when they close December, that triggers the calendar year on reports to be processed. So all of those will go out to the file archive. When W-2 submission is created, 
that's when the W-2 information goes out to the file archive. I just wanted to make you aware of that. Um, everything else under the supporting documents, I think we've kind of talked about, but I just wanted to make you aware of those other documents that I put out there. And again, we're, there's two checklists. The checklists have been updated because we do have new features now. And like I said, we have the uh, PDF option as well as the Word option. And then I did include the W2 master tape file uh, example out here because again, there are changes this year. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that I went in and put the newest uh, master tape file because you know, obviously we have all of these dates and all that information. So I just wanted to make sure you knew that that was out there as well. <clears throat> Does anyone have any other questions? Okay, I appreciate everybody tuning in. Everybody have a great weekend. Happy Friday the 13th. Don't be suspicious. We got through this just fine. And we will let you know as far as what we find out from uh, the developers as far as the, uh, does uh, December need to be reopened or not? Um, and Lori, just one other yep. thing. Um, I posted something out in the chat just to let everybody know that all of your chat questions, um, what we didn't answer, um, we are creating some documents of the chat history and we're going to post those out there in the wiki um, on that page where the presentation materials are at so that you guys can see all the questions and our answers. We've got a couple more. I just wrapped up the USAS ones and we'll get the payroll ones completed here and uh, we'll get those out there and post it to you before the end of the day. Thanks, Michelle. Okay. Thanks everybody and have a great weekend. Thank you. Thank you.